A few months ago, I set out to learn as much about computational biology and its myriad applications in biotech as I could. And on more than one occasion, that effort led me to a Zoom call with Matthias Alder. That my inquiry resulted in multiple opportunities to talk with Matthias made me happy. One, because he's a really great guy. And two, because while his company's drug discovery model leans heavily into proprietary structure-based computational methods, he's not one of these bombastic, over-the-top futurists who's all in on relinquishing science to the algorithms. Just the opposite, he's pragmatic and practical about the advantages and the limitations of deploying computational tools in an industry whose mission it is to save lives by injecting things into living human bodies. I'm Matt Piller. This is the Business of Biotech. And on today's show, I'm bringing you a conversation with my friend, Matthias Alder, newly appointed CEO at Gain Therapeutics. Matthias, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Matt. A real pleasure uh, to be here and look forward to the conversation. It's a pleasure to have you. It's great to, as I said, I enjoy, we've talked on the on the phone or on Zoom here a few times and I've enjoyed every minute of it. I really enjoy your uh, conversation with you and your perspectives on this topic. Uh, and I'm glad we could finally get you on the podcast. Um, before we get into some of the particulars around what GAIN is doing with computational though, I want our audience to have a chance to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, so I want to rewind back to your academic days. You've got a couple of law degrees. One, uh, yeah. I, I know you, you got your you got a law degree from uh, Miami, I believe, and, and there was one before that, right? Um, right. Straight away went to work in a large law firm, and at some point, your interests, uh, you know, either either changed to or, or zeroed in on on life sciences. So take us back to that. I just want to kind of get, get a feel for how things started for you coming out of school with a law degree and then uh, yeah. working your way into the life sciences. Uh, absolutely. And it, it was, you know, I'm originally from Switzerland. My first law degree was actually from uh, the University of Basel in Switzerland. And so I went to the U.S., got some international exposure, came back to, to Switzerland and wanted to work in the international environment, um, having some, you know, using what I've learned over the, over that uh, second, during the course of that second degree. And in Switzerland, you can go either into, you know, insurance, banking, or pharmaceuticals. And so that's the, the choices, right, that you have. And more by, by chance than by choice, um, I ended up actually working at at the, one of the large pharma companies in, in in Switzerland as my first job first job in, in the legal field, mm. and immediately I felt that that thrill of of working on something that that that's bigger than just creating the next widget, right? Or moving money around. What we're doing in in our industry is really benefiting all of humanity in the end and being part of that process, even as a lawyer at the time, I thought was really cool. Yeah. And so that's got me started. I then um, moved over to the US I, with my wife at the time, uh, still is my wife actually, uh, who happened, who I got to know when I was in the US for my postgraduate law degree. So we moved, she came to Switzerland, we moved back together in the mid nineties. And I joined that, that law firm by the name of Cooley, which was specializing on representing biotech companies. And that was a very conscious choice I made. I wanted to stay in the field and work with biotech companies, help them be successful. And so I developed a very extensive sort of deal sheet, transactional sheet, lots of M&A, lots of licensing deals, collaboration deals um, that ultimately then uh, led me to want to join the business as opposed to just being an advisor and then jumped into my first company as 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 a GC at the time, uh, mid 2006, I think it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So back in, in school, uh, there wasn't necessarily like a, a, a focus or a concentration in, in life sciences that kind of came after you after you left uh, after you after you graduated. That, with you. Yeah, it came after and and in a way, much to my surprise, because so the the reason I went into law school was because my strength weren't, strengths weren't uh, math or physics or biology. Um, and so I had to choose a different path. Um, but I always had an interest. And what I really 
felt um, uh, interested in is the, the science, you know, transactions and deal making. That was sort of the how I I I came into being where I am today, and 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 being able to take complex concepts and explain them in a way in layman's terms, which is actually helpful if you're not a scientist. You actually have think to have to think through things in a much sort of simpler ways and more structured way. And that that's that was really helped. So I don't get lost in the weeds, but I can sort of step up and look at the big picture. Yeah, I was going to say, I've had enough uh, conversation with you to know that uh, you, you're probably not giving yourself enough credit for your ability to express the, the technical and scientific chops because you do quite a, quite a good job at it. Um, and I, and I appreciate you. that. Um, you did, uh, you know, you did establish uh, just through general counsel work and, and consultative work uh, in, in the in the legal counsel space a, a pretty a pretty you know a promising what looked like a promising career there. At what point and why did you decide to sort of transition from the you know the zero, zero being zeroed in on the legal aspects to right. I, I think sort of the chief business officer and then on up through the the trajectory to your current role as CEO like right. well, what what uh was the catalyst for that transition uh, the, yeah i i wouldn't call it a midlife crisis really but <laughs> i was sort of in the middle of my career yeah. uh, and looking at what's going to do i was i did really well i was a partner at the firm had a great client base lots of interesting deals that i was doing um but in the end it was essentially doing the same thing over and over again, always the same thing. There was not really a, a progression from in terms of the professional experience I could have because I was, a, in all humbleness, I was really good at what, at, at, at what I was doing. So I mm -hmm. negotiated deals, you'd count them all together. It's you know in excess of $10 billion worth of bio box that I've accumulated in terms of deals and transactions I've worked on, but they were always the same in the end you knew exactly you know i'm going to say say this and then the other side is going to say that and then we'll come back with this and you know you sort of just know how the game was played and and i i looked at that and thought i could do that for the next 20 years or i, I maybe i should look at uh, exploring different horizons and then it's really logical move then to look at looked at the clients that i had and thought which which of the clients would i want to join and and happen to join then one of my clients as their first in-house uh, general counsel and from there on it was sort of a natural progression as i got more involved in the business on the business side business development side you know not not just doing the deal negotiation at the end but building up the all of the interactions leading up to a deal ultimately um, and also on the operational side, I became responsible in, in a couple of the companies I've been at uh, for human resources and built organizations from small sort of 30 to 50 people organizations to, you know, 200, 400 sized uh, people sized organizations, so a lot of operational experience of what it takes to build a company and along the way picking up, um, you know, all the challenges that we are facing in drug development, right? The things to anticipate, the hurdles that we face, and um, so that over time then led me to now where I'm today at, at Gain, really integrating that entirety of my professional experience as the CEO at Gain, and it's uh, uh, it's been a recent uh, sort of advancement to that role, but it's it's been incre incredibly thrilling and rewarding so far. Yeah, yeah, and I want to I want to ask you a little bit about your objectives as far as uh, the new role as CEO again is concerned. But before I do, I'm, I'm curious when you you know you, you you paint that picture about your transition from the focus on uh, the legal aspects to chief business officer, then chief operations officer, and right. the CEO suite, uh, uh, position. Um, you, you you sort of frame that up like you know you you wanted to expand your your influence and your opportunity to be influential within a company beyond the legal aspect. And right. um, I'm curious about your um, reflections on on your findings when you made those moves. Uh, was, was the grass truly greener on the other side? Were there aspects of, uh, you know, those transitions that you felt particularly I don't know, inadequate uh, to or, or or unprepared for, perhaps, or just, so what, what were your findings along the way? I guess every transition, you know, that I've made has has been um, 
you know, I wasn't prepared for what I was going to take on. I mean, every step of the way in terms of my entire career. But I was always focused on just taking what I had already known, what I've learned, what I know how to do, build on that, expand into something else, leverage that to do to something more that's related, but building on it. And that you can see, you know, going from being an in-house lawyer at a Swiss big pharma company, right? You're really a small cog there in, in the system to becoming sort of the lead lawyer for biotech companies as an outside advisor to become the GC for a company. First time, you know, I was a deal guy and then had to beef up on all the SEC things. It was a publicly traded company. So really getting up the curve on that. And to, from there on, then expect, sorry, expanding on to into business development and the interactions. But it it really all, it feels looking back and also looking forward, it felt like a natural progression at each step of what mm -hmm. I was going to do next. Yeah. Uh, I've always been interested in in in, in science, technology and, and people. And, and, you know, at every step of the way, it was adding further elements in different directions in terms of my my experience. Yeah, very good. Uh, when I first met you uh, a few months back, you were not CEO again. You were Chief op Operations Officer, Oper maybe? Yes, exactly. CEO. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so the, the CEO role is one that you took on weeks, if not just a couple months ago, maybe? A couple of months ago, mid-September, yeah. 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 Um, so, so with that, uh, with that new title, uh, and, and you know, kind of the, the handing off of the reins there, what are your, I guess, early kind of ob objectives that, that that are sort of right. right in front of you? Well, I, I think, I mean, I was, I was actually very happy to to with the way how the transition happened. The plan was always and. The former CEO Eric Richman um, actually at the time already had sort of looked for a successor at the time I joined, and so it was really in the anticipation of me eventually taking over that I joined joined again, and it played out couldn't have played out any better really. So I had a full year's worth of time to get fully uh, ingrained in the company, understanding uh, you know the the platform that we're going to talk about in just a minute the understanding the programs the science behind it knowing the getting to know the people and and so forth and so it's been a very seamless transition and so it's not i'm not in a in a situation where you're coming in as a new ceo need to figure things out right and mm -hmm. what's actually going on so i actually know what's going on and so we're in terms of from me taking over is really just pushing forward down the path um that we have already set ourselves on. And that is focused really on three areas. One is, is very firmly focused on executing on the lead program that we have in, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, that program is moving through preclinical stage, late preclinical development is getting into the clinic middle of next year. So very much an execution task. They are making sure that things uh, stay on track and we have the project team working together and. And we're anticipating all of the things that need to be done on uh, towards getting the, the company to, for the first time, really becoming a clinical stage company. So that's going to be a major transition for us. Mm -hmm. uh, the other area of focus, uh, which is also one of the reasons why the company and the board was interested in, in bringing me in, is, is business development. They obviously have a very extensive business development background. Uh, we have numerous opportunities uh, as a company with our assets that we have both on the pipeline side, but also with the platform to engage in very interesting uh, transactions, collaborations, uh, and licensing deals with, with pharma companies and other uh, companies in the industry. And so there's a big focus on that for me to, to move that forward and, and getting deal, deal, deals done over the coming period. Yeah. And then finally, there's a, obviously in the current market environment, there's a lot of um, engagement that uh, with investors that need, needs to take place because we need to tell the story, be out there, keep keep up the awareness because there's a lot of competition for attention and and we want to be one of the companies that people think of when they think about investing in the sector uh the computational drug discovery sector or the companies with neurodegenerative disease programs yeah yes and on on the former of those two points uh the comp you know computational biology uh company sector um it's an increasingly 
busy space, right? We see a lot of a lot of companies making claims anyway to to be leveraging computational biology um, right. in their drug discovery efforts. Several, you know, tons of companies that are creating platforms that uh, you know perhaps not with with zero intention of creating their own pipeline or building their own candidates. They're looking to right. you know, be, be service providers uh, solely. It's just a very, very, very busy space right now. And I mean, I've got my theories on why that is. Uh, you know, you mentioned the restricted capital markets. There's a lot of expectation that biopharmaceutical companies, especially new and emerging ones, do do more, more quickly with fewer right. resources. And I believe this is a technology that could step in to, uh, to fill some of those gaps. But again, um, you know, your your roots there are deep. You're a company who is not, I wouldn't classify as, you as, as one of these maybe academically rooted companies who is sort of having to take a step backwards and revisit where computational might fit within its structure. Gain, uh, you know, the computational approach is, is seated very deeply, right, at, at Gain. So I want to learn a little bit about that. Tell us, um, you know, before we get into the platform itself. Right. Theoretically, fundamentally, why? Is computational so central to to Gaines' approach? Well, I think it, it goes back to the, the 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 founding of the company, which was it's actually founded based on the platform uh, that was developed. You mentioned we're now uh, sort of scientifically founded. We have actually uh, the 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 person who has developed the platform is our chief technology officer, Shavi Baril. He was and still is a professor at the University of Barcelona. So um, he has had the opportunity to to uh, create this platform. And then uh, the gain was founded about five years ago around around the platform. Mm -hmm. um, and the interesting part of the platform is it really has come, it has developed over time and has come to fruition really only in the last 18 months or so. Because of that, we are now able to combine the, the advances in, in uh, computational power through supercomputing that becomes increasingly accessible uh, with the uh, artificial intelligence powered um, advances in structural biology. These are all big words, uh, but the, uh, we can, as we're going to go through the platform, I can uh, sort of be a bit more specific. And I think you touched on an important point. There's a lot of companies out there that have very flashy websites and things moving around but ultimately all comes down to the you know the technology and the science behind it mm -hmm. and i think what differentiates us from many of those companies is that we have actually applied our platform to build the entirety of our pipeline we have about nine programs now that we have identified with the platform with the lead program moving into uh, the clinical development uh, in the middle of this coming year. So it's a very well-validated platform where, we, where it's not just a hypothetical construct that we have created, but we have tangible evidence yeah. that it actually works and is able to create valuable uh, drug development programs for us. Yeah. When it was a hypothetical construct, right? Like when it was an idea. And perhaps this predates you, Matthias, and that, that's fine. I just want to get your perspective on it, right. um, knowing what you know now about the company. When, when it was a theoretical idea or a hypothetical, what drove the what if? Like, like I said, like right now, right. I believe I believe there's a market opportunity for technologies like this because the what if is what if we could extend our cash runway by doing things a lot more efficiently. And in, in, in less time on the discovery side, that's the driver, right? In, in my mind, that's or at least one right. driver. Um, you know, back, back then, what was the what if? Was it was it more like, you know, technology is cool, big data is cool, we're not leveraging it enough, we could probably do something cool here, or was it, you know, we want to build something that we can sell? What was sort of that motivating factor? It, it was actually much more fundamental and driven by um, a in a way, a, a shortcoming of what uh, drug development looked like at the time, in that um, you know many of 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 our um, the human diseases are caused by proteins that are either doing too much or too little and don't function correctly. Um, but only about ten percent of those proteins are druggable because they have a known binding site where you can engage 
with a with a with a with a with a product to actually in, interact with the protein to in, impact it in the way that's desired to affect the disease. Ninety mm. percent of proteins um, have been at the time undrockable, and so the what if was the question was that Javi asked himself is what if we could develop a platform a technology that allows us to target those 90 percent of proteins that are not drug, uh, not drugable because they don't have a non-binding site so the focus was on developing a platform and a technology that allows us to identify new binding sites new ways new places where products can interact with a protein surface that have never been seen before and even on proteins that have previously been considered not struggle because there was no way to find you know these these places of interaction and so that was the origin and so he developed uh, javi developed the platform it got the gain eventually got created based on that platform and with the platform we have now shown in in multiple programs that we can identify novel binding sites on proteins that have you know previously been undruggable we have also been able to show that with and that's the additional benefit that we have with the platform is that we can accelerate the drug discovery process from what typically with traditional met methods takes two plus years through high throughput screening um, so in physics-based assays, if you're if you're doing that with a computational platform, we can accelerate that that process to to less than three months. So an incredible gain in time that we can achieve. And if you're thinking about the drug development process, you know drug discovery, drug de uh, preclinical development, clinical development, that takes up to ten years. And we're cutting off the initial two years of drug discovery and reducing that to three months. It's just an incredibly powerful tool. Yeah. And as you said, pharma companies increasingly are looking at how can we be more efficient? How can we speed up the development process? Because time is money and every every you know month spent in, in discovery that is that is not is not really advancing the program. And so yeah. That's why I think we are at a really good spot and at a sweet spot really in terms of where the industry is moving and where we can come in with our platform to fill to fill a need. Yeah. OK, now I'm going to uh, g give you the, the moment you've been waiting for where we can actually talk about the platform. I'll, I'll stop with all my <laughs> you know, rambling preamble questions, but it's important. It, it's important because, you know, without a discussion around what you're doing with the platform, how it works, what's what's going in, what's coming out and how it works. Um, you know, a lot of this machine learning, computational biology talk can get chalked up to, you know, some like black box, you know, voodoo magic that, that happens right. with right. without understanding around, uh, you know, what, what the application looks like. So, um, so, so let's start with, uh, let's start with, with data. Um, I've had plenty of conversations with people in this space who talk about the struggle, the data struggle, right? Like there's a, a there's a, a lot of big, and big, they call it big data for a reason. There's a lot of data out there. Um, and attempts to leverage like publicly available data or unstructured data from the cloud and myriad other resources right. um, have been met with challenge, uh, you know, bec because it's unstructured, because it's, you know, the, because there are anomalies uh, in, in the data. Um, in your case, the data that's go that's feeding the machine is is proprietary. Is that correct? So let, let's start with like what's going in in the first place. Absolutely. So uh, you're right. Uh, the, there's a lot of talk about big data, and if you you know, especially companies in the in the artificial intelligence field, are and machine learning field, they are reliant on a lot of data to teach their computational models, what to look for and to learn. Mm -hmm. Where we are very different from, from those companies is that we don't actually need any big data at all. Uh, what we are, what the platform is, is it's a, a structure-based and a physics-based uh, platform. And the only uh, data that we need, information that we need is the structure of the protein uh, that that we are that we want to investigate with with the platform, and the protein structure originally used to you know you had to get to through comp to through uh, experimental methods uh, cryo EM, X ray crystallography NMR other other tools to to create that or define what the structure is of the protein, 
um, we can use that for the platform. That's really helpful. But what re literally has exploded the the target universe for us is the is the arrival of of AlphaFold, which is a uh, an AI powered uh, platform that Google has developed through their DeepMind uh, subsidiary company. And, and with that platform, what we can predict the structure, the 3D structure of a protein from just a 1D uh, oligonuclear sequence. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with that uh, access to AlphaFold, which is an open source platform, we are using AI in a way, but it's not core to our platform. It's a, it gives us the starting point of what we need, which is the protein structure. Yeah. Uh, once we have the protein structure that we um, build that into the platform, there's a lot of, it takes sort of one to two weeks for us to, to, to look at the structure, analyze it, build it into the platform. And what we're doing with the structure in the, in the platform is, is um, interrogating the entire surface of the protein with small molecule probes with organic molecules to measure computationally the the binding interaction seeing where these small molecules go how they interact with the protein surface and we measure these interactions mm -hmm. um and then we analyze these these the, the binding free energy that of these interactions and are able to categorize and identify binding hotspots so where do most of the molecules go we have multiple probes that we're using where do many of them go what kind of uh, where, where is that spot? Are there other hot sp binding hotspots around that? And do those hotspots sit in a sort of a, a, a structure, a, a fold that, that where, a, where, a, where a product, a, a small molecule can actually bind onto the surface of the protein? Yeah. And so we're able to use that platform. It takes one to two weeks to, to, to come up with that binding spot where we can find uh, that will be suitable for for intervention through through with our with our molecules that we're looking at yeah. and so that's the first step that's the first um, step and I'm, I'm going to back up real quick with a quick quick right. follow-up question on on step one and it's early step one what uh right. what what sort of guide rails or or uh, i guess what what guides uh the decision around the determination of which proteins you're going to interrogate i th that is very much driven by the disease that we're looking at um and um so as a company we're not doing strictly speaking target discovery so we're not trying to find new proteins and figure out what these proteins do in a particular disease so we're relying on on literature um okay. to to review saying okay this is a protein that plays a role if it doesn't work then then a disease develops and so we're taking that information as a basis to select um, uh, our our targets for our drug discovery programs, and so All it's right, sure. it's really yeah. based on work that other people have done, but it really gives us a, a leg up in terms of starting starting at a point that's already validated. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for clearing that up. It's an important point because you mentioned from the outset you're like you know we we don't necessarily need big data, but you know if you if you if you don't put that caveat out there, like we're working with proteins that we already know are associated with a specific. Right indication you know you, you could get to a big uh, real big day uh, situation <laughs> real, real quick yeah right so you just took us through through step one uh sort of how the analysis and assessment takes place like wh what does that analysis and assessment look like when it's potentially successful we're going to say potentially successful because you know, we're going to get to this part of the conversation. You don't, you right. don't run, you don't run the algorithm and and spit out a win. There's more to it beyond that. But um, it, you run the algorithm and you and you and you right. spit out a perhaps a a, a better um, indication that you're close, right? Right. Yeah. Precisely. So the, the what the initial step uh, in the platform where we're identifying a binding site uh, does is we're running a, a molecular dynamic uh, model. It gives us literally hundreds of potential uh, binding sites on a protein. And what we do then is apply a, a proprietary patented algorithm to analyze specifically these binding sites. And in the end, after sort of a, a screening campaign on a protein, we end up with two, maybe three potential binding sites that we believe have real value. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is not just looking at numbers and you know, it's not like an app that spits out uh, a result. 
a lot of that is also using the experience of the, of the computational team and medchem team that we have at the company who have been working with this platform for many years to understand the data and what it really means and understand uh, what the binding pocket would have to look like to be to be a promising binding pocket and all that. So there's a lot of human assessment and analysis that needs to go into finding the appropriate uh, binding sites. We end up with two to three. We then run um, a, a virtual screening campaign where we're looking at knowing at an atomic level what the binding hotspots are within a binding pocket that we have found. We're looking for molecules that fit onto these binding hotspots and fit structurally into the, the pocket, the size of the pocket that we have. Mm -hmm. And we're running a, a, a docking protocol. There's other people who do that um, as well. There's, as you mentioned, there is there are competitors out there who, who use some of the similar methods. But we have a, a differentiator again with our methodology that we're not only looking at how a, pro, how a, a molecule binds onto the surface, we also look at how much power it takes to pull it off. So an undocking protocol that we run. And that allows us to eliminate 80 to 90% of, uh, mo of molecules that appear to be good good candidates for, for drug development, but then turn out not to, bi to be binding tightly enough. Yeah. And so again, it's an important step. And again, that's a proprietary step that we apply that we then allows us to pick of the probably 1,000, 2,000 hits or so that we, that we get from a virtual screening campaign. We pick the 100 or so molecules that are the most promising different chemistries to, to really then uh, do the, that's the, the third step then, do the um, in in lab, so real life wet lab uh, assessment of what these what these compounds actually do in real life experiments. Yeah. And I think there is you've alluded to the, you know, is, is is it all AI? Is it all computational? It is actually not. We believe what we do is we get to a starting point very quickly. Uh, in terms of knowing the, the the structure and the molecules, but then we always need to confirm whether the predictions that the model is making, we need to confirm that prediction in real experiments in real life to know whether or not what we have found is a winner or not. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple, a couple of follow-ups I want to ask you around, uh, you know, uh, in, in that vein, right? Um, your, your your transition from in silico to, you know, to, to wet lab, uh, I often hear the, the term unicorn used uh, when, when folks try to describe the scientist who is, well, you know, adept at both computational biology and, you know, traditional research science, wet, wet lab yeah. science. Like this person doesn't exist. And I, and I think, you know, I, I think that's a, an overstatement. I think it's changing. I think you know, ac academia is probably paying a little bit more attention to that now and, and, and putting out some, um, you know, some fresh young talent that's a, a little bit more savvy on, on both sides of that spectrum. But that being said, I, I, you know, I've had conversations with biotech leaders such as, your, you know, folks in, in similar roles to you uh, who, who talk about the need to juxtapose somehow or entrench uh the 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 IT side of, of the talent pool and right. the you know more traditional uh biology side of the of the talent pool. Uh, how, how do you do that again? So that's that's the first first follow-up to what you just said. Like that, that transition, right. I mean how, how do you make sure that the right hand and the left hand are holding hands, so to speak? Yeah, I, I think it's it's pretty organic really within the company because that's how the company was set up. And it's it's really just another you know, element or or evidence or or instance of 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 inter interdisciplinary science, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't. And I think that's really the, the the key here. You need to have people who are open to looking at 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 the science in 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 different ways and and being open to to p putting what initially appeared to be different pieces really putting together in, into a whole. And we have done that really successfully in GAIN in that we have our computational team that focuses primarily on, on looking at finding the binding sites and, and, and the, the, the virtual hits. They're sitting right next to our medicinal chemists who then look at the structures that come out of the virtual screening and identify red flags or green flags. 
uh, or ways to rescreen things in a, in a better way. Uh, and they sit right next to uh, the our people who are uh, in in the labs. And you know, when they write reports, they they sit in the same office uh, as the people who do the actual wet lab experiments in the, in the labs that we have in, in that same location. And so it's just a very natural and integrated way how how we are operating. And what, which was always also why we think this is truly it is a platform, even though there are different pieces that we are putting together here. It can only work and it only works because everybody is working together in an integrated fashion. Yeah, yeah. The, the other follow up I had uh, was around the, the uh, I guess, the acknowledgement of the skepticism around machine learning. You you were you were careful to say, like, you know, we, we don't rely entirely on the output of the algorithm, we, we then, you know, take great care to take it to the web right. lab and, and uh, con confirm or, you know, con confirm or reject, right, uh, findings. Right, precisely. So I'm curious about your, you know, e even beyond just what's going on in game, what your worldview is on, you, you know, or, or your vision for responsibly ensuring that what's happening in these in silico, you know, activities is, is now and, and will continue to into the future translate into in vivo safety and and, and efficacy um right like just sort of like i said big big picture how, how do we everybody fears right like i mean you know you watch some sci-fi movies you come away thinking the algorithms are going to take over the world right? like <laughs> we talk about these very real as i said in the uh in the intro we're talking about um relying to some degree on machines and algorithms to help us develop products that will make their way into the human body, hopefully to therapeutic effect. Uh, right. how, how do we make sure that we're making that transition responsibly? Well, I think this is really so how I, so big picture wise, I think this is how we're using technology in the best way. It's really to aid and speed up, but not replace, uh, you know, the, the human factor in terms of what what it what what is required to develop a, a safe and effective drug, um, I mentioned right. So the drug the the process of getting a, a drug to market, you have the discovery phase, the, the preclinical develop development phase, and the clinical development phase. And what we're essentially doing with our platform is taking care of the initial drug discovery phase. So we're getting to that. Through, through that very quickly, you know, less than three months compared to two plus years. And then the work really starts in terms of making sure that, that the, the molecule that we have identified, the drug is actually effective and actually safe. And so we are from that point on going through the traditional process of drug development. So we're doing the in vitro models, the in vivo models, we're going to preclinical talks, and then we're taking it into the phase one study and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so we're not actually trying to short circuit and take a molecule straight from in vitro into a human where I think that the real there would be a real concern about what, what are you guys doing, but it, it's really speeding up the initial phase and which is already a huge value that we can co contribute in this in this overall process. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, to uh, one of the big questions I have for you is like, to to what end are you experiencing success at gain with its uh, with its uh, therapeutic pipeline? And you mentioned, I, I think a little bit ago, you mentioned that you've got eight, eight or nine, eight or nine candidates that yep. have yep. have have been you know born of at least some element of your application of your own platform technology. So tell us a little bit about that. Just give, give us some color on, I guess, examples of where contributions from the platform have led to or, or lent to uh, the clinical progress of your, your own internal pipeline. Right. right. Well, I think if you're looking at um, our pipeline, there is a, a, a significant block of that is in lysosomal storage disorders. And Going back to the point about how do we pick our protein, these are all caused by, these lysosomal storage disorders are caused by genetic mutations that impact an enzyme that plays a critical role in cell health. Mm -hmm. And so these enzymes, you know, couldn't be targeted before, right? You, did, you didn't really, what, what you need to do is really quite novel, which is what we've been able to do. So we found on these enzymes a place for uh, uh, where a compound can interact with the surface 
to restore proper folding and restore the function of the enzyme. And that's a very unique uh, approach that has really been enabled by our uh, platform that allowed us to specifically look for uh, uh, products that actually have that effect that would not have been otherwise possible. And as a result, we have been, been able to develop this, this very robust uh, pipeline in lysosomal storage disorders. Um, in terms of selection of the enzyme, we're actually the can't take the credit for that. Uh, it was actually the our uh, scientific team was really smart about that in that they picked for uh, the, the program that we have in Gaucher disease, they picked the enzyme that is also responsible for about 14% of, of, of Parkinson's patients to have, to start to develop Parkinson's disease. So it's the same mutation uh, from that same gene that expresses that same enzyme that is misfolded, that plays a role both in Gaucher and in Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, based on that, it had allowed, had allowed, has allowed it to expand our rare disease uh, program into the much larger indication of Parkinson's disease, and that's the one that we're now taking into the clinic. And so, uh, from you know, it, it's been really rewarding to see the thought that went into that applying the platform and now being able to reap the fruits of of all that early smart thinking that the company has been able to do yeah yeah and as far as uh taking that parkinson's candidate into the clinic's concerned I, I'll, I'll also know for the benefit of our audience uh that work has caught uh some the, you know the, the the attention of some important players in that space and very influential part, uh, players in that space you're collaborating with the michael j fox foundation on right. on that project which is good company to have when it's, you're when you're moving into a, a space like that. It, it is uh, really rewarding to have have gained that support from from the the Michael J. Uh, J. Fox Foundation, and they've been a, a big supporter initially with a financial support to get the program progressing to where we are today, and at this point we continue to work very closely with them on um, you know framing out the clinical program, looking at biomarkers that are important in Parkinson's disease that we can measure, uh, looking at disease progression, disease symptoms, and, and all of that. And so it's it's a very, uh, it's an ongoing, a very uh, close collaboration that we have with the foundation. We're very grateful for, for their support. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the next, the next step in terms of the clinical activity for the, the Parkinson's candidate? So with that program, we are now in, in late preclinical development. We're going through the, the toxicology studies, animal studies that are required before we are allowed to take that uh, that product into humans. Mm -hmm. um, that work is progressing well. We're on track to uh, start the uh, to make the the, the re required filings for starting the phase one study in the middle of the year and then take it into the clinic uh, from there on. So yeah. it's... Um, well in hand and well progressing well. Good. And as you as you plan that clinical activity, um, you know, you, you just mentioned part of your work with the Michael J. Fox Foundation is around discovery of, of biomarkers uh, and, and other things that indicate to me that perhaps there's an application, there's there's an application potential for uh, computational approaches, machine learning, whatever it might be on, on the clinical side as well uh you know whether that's efficiency and yes. patient population identification you know plenty plenty of applications there probably and, and you and i uh spoke briefly about this not too long ago so i want to give you an opportunity to talk about what you uh envision or intend to do with uh these the, you know high-tech approaches right uh, as, as you move from you know development into into clinical uh, and that's a thank you for raising that it's a very important aspect obviously being a, a a company rooted in in uh, on the computational side with our drug discovery platform, we are acutely aware and interested in in exploiting the these advances that really help accelerate or streamline or spec make 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 increase the likelihood of success of of a clinical program, and and so we're looking at a number of 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 platforms that that other companies have developed, many of them using. AI, big data to really suss out uh, some of these disease aspects. Um, if that allows us maybe potentially to select, uh, uh, have a better patient selection um, in our clinical studies to ensure that we have 
the appropriate patients for the product that we are developing. The uh, other aspects include looking at uh, some more hardware-like tools that can play a real role in terms of wearables, looking at symptom progression or lack thereof in the clinical study in Parkinson's in particular. There's now you know, wristbands and things like that that provide ongoing measurements in terms of the, the locomotion impairment, the gait, and, and things like that that we can apply in our clinical study to capture that data and, and make sure that we're making the right choices as we're developing the, the, developing the product in these patients. Yeah, very cool. Very exciting. Um, and an opportunity, again, an opportunity for GAIN to, to, to be on the, the leading, if not bleeding edge, of some of the applications for that new technology. Very good. Yeah. All right. We're we're uh, we're kind of running short on time here, uh, Matthias, but I, I got I, I got at least one more big question for you that you may or may not be able to answer. And I don't want to put you on the spot. This is the one that makes the investor relations and public relations people a little bit nervous. Right. Uh, but when I reflect on what gain is today, what what what, what it's come from and, and what it's become today, I see this company that's built a, a platform that in and of itself is a, is a valuable, valuable, you know, product, right, to the life yeah. sciences community, to the to the you know, pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical community. Um, and a lot of companies that are trying to do that, you know, you take that uh, CTX platform that you've developed and you can just say that's what we do you know we offer that as a service even to uh you know to other pharmaceutical companies but i also see a company that's developed a, a pipeline and is making you know significant preclinical progress has plans to go into the clinic uh next year um and i know that there are multiple answers to this question but what's the end game for for you know matthias's vision for for gain therapeutics do you want to you know, do you want to be a service provider slash therapeutic developer? Do you want to be a, you know, pre to early clinical developer and then, you know, sell off assets? Do you want to develop stuff that goes all the way to the commercial finish line? Like what's sort of the, we always talk about, end, uh, you know, begin right. with the end in, in mind. Is there an end in mind for game? Well, so tongue in cheek, I would say you said it all of the above. <laughs> okay. um, uh, no, I, the way I, the way I think about uh, gain is really we have two asset uh, buckets that we can leverage. One is the pipeline uh, that we have generated with the platform, and there we have a lead program in Parkinson's disease moving into the clinic. We have follow-on programs, and that provides both the opportunity for intrinsic value creation by developing these products and creating more evidence that they will actually work and, and creating more investor confidence in, in, in what we're doing there. But they also provide an opportunity for partnering. So as a small company, it's very clear that we're not never ever going to be able to develop all nine programs in parallel and take them all, all the way to market. And so we are very active in looking at uh, engage, engaging with uh, potential partners in the pharmaceutical industry to to take licenses and, and engage in collaborations with us, which then helps generate uh, non-dilutive cash inflow for us from license revenues and things like that. So we're looking at the pipeline from both angles there. And the same really for the platform. The platform allows us both to generate additional programs early on that, that are actually, it's incredibly inexpensive for us to develop these initial programs because the computational methods are already there. We need, just need to rent some supercomputing time and run them and we can come up with new programs in in a split second almost. Um, but we're also looking at the platform from that angle in terms of this is, should be valuable and is valuable to, you know, the pharmaceutical industry to to potential partners who may want to engage into in discovery collaborations with us if they have a protein target of interest that they haven't been able to find anything to work with we can actually take that protein run our platform and spit out at the other end a product that then that partner can take on take back and develop themselves and so again there it's in, in inherent value creation as well as, well as cr value creation through through collaborations, and and we're pursuing uh, uh, you know all of these aspects in in parallel. So, for from my perspective, I'm mean, we were incredibly well positioned um, with 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 the company with Gain 
uh, to take this, take us forward and through this very turbulent time that we now see in the capital markets and that has an impact all across the industry. But with the assets that the, that we have, the opportunities of value creation that we have, I'm very op, op, optimistic about what we can achieve uh, with with our team here at Game in terms of uh, progressing the company to its to the next level. Yeah, yeah. Well, well done. Well done. Response to that question because it was both. Uh, thorough yet yet vague, open ended enough to keep uh, the PR and IR police happy. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, what haven't I asked you, Matthias? That uh, is is central to the story. What what you know? What 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 should I have asked you that I did not ask you? Well, uh, to me, we're uh, in the biotech industry, and I mentioned that uh, before. Right? The reason we're here and the reason we're doing what we're doing is to, to develop new therapies for patient in, patients in need. And we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about our Parkinson's program, but we are really excited about what we have there. Because with our approach, uh, we are essentially... Um, correcting uh, uh, an enzyme that is a protein in the body that's not working right. And because we are correcting that enzyme, we're able to restore the healthy cell. So it's, it's, it's a very sort of uh, fundamental approach that we are pursuing. So we're creating with our, with our product, we're creating a healthy cell, which then that cell uh, survives longer. And that happens specifically also with dopaminergic neurons. So these are cells that produce dopamine and the lack of dopamine in the brain ultimately causes uh, Parkinson's symptoms. And so with our approach, we're able to restore the the, the function of the enzyme and, the, the, and restore the healthy cell, and store, restore the survival of the cell, and as a result, uh, restore the production of dopamine in the, in the brain. And with that, we have the ability to have a disease modifying therapy for Parkinson's patients that currently only get their symptoms treated and eventually they get worse and worse and worse over time. Yeah. And so having the opportunity here with GAIN to be at the forefront in a very severe and significant disease and for doing significant work for patients in needs, that's really, that's what it's all about. And that has us, you know, getting up every morning and going to work and, and looking forward to really progressing that program into the clinic and into patients to provide that benefit um, and uh, look forward to that to that yeah the coming years to achieve to, to achieve that that big goal yeah definitely and and you know I, I guess it's important to point out you probably already already did but just to sort of reinforce that that uh, that act that activity that happens at the enzymatic level is post like it's it, it 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 it's done without any genetic modification it's it's after the genes that that's work so i think Correct. i think i mean you know i'm not not necessarily an expert i i observe you know i talk to a lot of folks but it occurs to me that the potential uh safety advantages and also um complexity advantages over you know perhaps some of the genetic therapies true you know true gene therapies right. uh, that are that are looking at this indication um yeah it occurs to me that there are probably some advantages on 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 the uh, gains approach there are and there's it's obviously we're not the only ones developing uh you know new products in parkinson's disease gene therapy is 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 out there mm -hmm. um there are a number of challenges with with these approaches and you know there's a number of high profile you know, failure, shall we say, uh, in terms of gene therapy programs. The other aspect is that gene therapy ultimately is always going to be a very, very, very expensive therapy. And especially for larger indications like Parkinson's disease, it's not quite imaginable how any healthcare system can actually afford uh, paying that therapy for patients who need it. And so having uh, an approach like we have, which is a, a small molecule approach, is a standard way to develop it, standard way to manufacture it, standard way to commercialize it. We, we're not trying to forge a new path here. It's going to come out uh, with an effect that is can be gene therapy-like in that we're 
fixing the enzyme that that gets misfolded because of a genetic mutation. Um, so we're fixing the enzyme and have the opportunity to have that disease modifying effect that gene therapy also has has the potential to have. And so it's it's a great opportunity. I think we're competitively well positioned. Um, we're clearly the leading program with our mechanism of action, um, and it's our job to to push it through and make it make it that the uh, you know yeah. fulfill the promise that we currently hold in our hands. Sure, yeah, you, your job now, bud. You got the you took the CEO role. It's your job now. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to to take it on and bear it and bring it forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's excellent, Matthias. I uh, I really enjoy talking with you. I appreciate you coming on to share the story with us. It's uh, fascinating work. I think this was super insightful for our audience. Well, I love these application stories around around computational. I appreciate the detail you gave us. So, thank you for joining us. And uh, you know, we'll, thank you, Matt. I'll, I'll make sure we stay in touch, and we'll do it again sometime. Wonderful. Much appreciate. Thanks for the opportunity. Great to talk to you. Yeah, you too. So that's Gain Therapeutics CEO, Matthias Alder. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. In case you missed it, we just launched a newsletter to accompany this program, and I'd like you to sign up for it at bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B. I'd also like you to show Cytiva some love for its support of this project by going to cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech to check out all the great resources they've procured for new and emerging biotechs. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review.